I'm joined here now by former MP and comedian Giles Brandreth, who's performing at the Warwick Arts Centre tonight. Giles, how are you? Well, I'm well. I love your way of saying you're joined. Actually, <laughs> you're joining me because this is my dressing room. Yes, I am actually. And I'm, I'm... the whole place is amazing here. I came into the Warwick Arts Centre, haven't been for a few years, and it sort of suddenly turned into sort of, I don't know, Gatwick Airport. It's <laughs> deluxe, it's huge, it's amazing. It's um, very impressive. And backstage, can I tell you, some of the theatres I have been to, well, they haven't changed a lot since the Victorian heyday of touring theatres. <laughs> Whereas this is bright and breezy, it's clean, it's cheerful, it is a credit to Warwick University. Thank you very much. Um, we'll start now on the tour. It's called Word Power. And obviously you've got a long history of words. I know you were the, you're the honorary president of the Association of British Scrabble Players, I'm told. Uh, tell us about the tour. How's it been so far? It's been on for a couple of months now. It's been on for a couple of decades, it seems. <laughs> It's a curious life, this, this touring. In fact, it's, it's 45 dates uh, around the United Kingdom. And uh, I, it always has the same, the same experience. When I arrive, wherever I'm going, I wonder where, where I am, why I am, why I'm still doing it. And then by the interval, I think, oh, it's not too bad. And then by the end of the show, I think, oh, this is fantastic. Oh, this is great. And then I have the horror of going out into the streets and uh, trying to find somewhere to eat. The real challenge of touring is there aren't places to eat. Mm. I've been doing this off and on now for more than 40 years. And when I began doing this sort of thing, when you came out of a theatre at 10, 10.30, 11 at night, you went to the local Chinese restaurant. Well, Chinese restaurants don't exist in the same way. Um, for good reasons, because Chinese people maybe don't want to run restaurants, but they don't want to run restaurants because they're running accountancy firms and solicitors firms and they're doing other things. The families are not carrying on the tradition of Chinese restaurants. So if you're lucky, you will find a delicious Bangladeshi restaurant, but even those are not as many as there used to be. So it's quite a challenge. So often my wife and I retreat to the Premier Inn in the hope of bumping into um, Lenny Henry, but he doesn't. I mean, I, I, we've seen the advertisements. We have never seen him, actually, to be honest. We are at Premier Inns all the time. We're looking under the pillows, under the beds. No sign of a Sir Lenny, but we sneak in our M&S or Waitrose food, mm -hmm. and we sit on the edge of the balsa wood bed, and we tuck into a late night feast. So that's the, that's the touring life. It's fascinating because... It's live theatre, and that is what is intriguing about it. Mm. Uh, and it, the show is a celebration of words and language. It's called Word Power because words are what define us. I love language. Uh, English is the richest language in the world. I mean, literally, 500,000 words in the Oxford English Dictionary. French equivalent has about 100,000 words, and that includes the weekend. So we have this wonderfully rich language, and it's worth celebrating because language is power. Language is what defines us, differentiates us from the animals and those whose hands do trade upon the ground. As Bertrand Russell, the great philosopher, once said, no matter how eloquently a dog may bark, he cannot tell you that his parents were poor but honest. Only words can do that. So it's a show all about words. And to go with the show, there is a book called Word Play. And after the show, we set up our stall this is the reality of show business. We set up our stall uh, outside and, um, and we flog the merch. It's called the merch. <laughs> uh, and my wife collects the money. And why do we do this? Because we need the money. Um, as I explained to people, I've discovered, we've both discovered over the years, that money is in fact the one thing keeping us in touch with our children. <laughs> so we still have to bring in some money and we try to keep hold of it because nobody told us about um Panama. So uh, we, <laughs> we didn't get the memo. <laughs> we didn't get the memo when that one was going around. We missed out on that. So we're we're still earning our keep. So we sell the merch. And the book is the book of the show. It's called Wordplay. It's a celebration of words and language. And it's got some of the meatier stuff in it. You know, for example, in the show. Oh, oh there, 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 there's. I don't have a support band. Some acts go on. They just do 50 minutes, you know, or an hour. Because this show began in Edinburgh as an hour. But it has to be a full evening. So it's a two-hour show. Some of the acts bring on support acts. I don't know if that's. But that may be whoever was here as the madman. It could be the stripper. I don't know. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's somebody singing in the background. Backstage life. So we sell the merch. We sell the book. But the book does more substantial stuff than the show can do. Uh, for example, in the show, we talk about politicians and uh, their use of language. And, of course, Barack Obama 
could be credited with having become president because of his eloquence. Oh, here's somebody coming in. This is Martin, who is the excellent sound <laughs> guy here at the Warwick Arts Centre. And uh, Martin has just put the batteries into the mic. And they seem to be working. He's getting credit. Hey, he's waving at his... And he's famous now. Anyway, so, for example, I talk about Barack Obama and how his eloquence eight years ago during the presidential campaigns made him stand out from the crowd and how words do define politicians. Certainly, I don't think I'd remember his predecessor, the 43rd President of the United States, George W. Bush, had it not been for his amazing way with words. Mm. He's the fellow who said, you know, the trouble with the French is they don't have a word for entrepreneur. <laughs> in the book, I'm able to give you a whole collection of Bushisms. Obviously, in the show, it's a two-hour show. It's a roller coaster. We hope it's a magic carpet ride around the world of words. They can't be the substance there is in the book. Right. And now on the subject of words, um, you obviously spent a lot of time in the House of Commons where there's a lot of a lot of words. Uh, I know Jacob Rees-Mogg famously uses uh, interesting words there. I was just wondering, what profession would you say you preferred, uh, comedy or politics, or are they quite similar? Well, there is, among certain politicians, a kind of theatrical bent. Uh, and I think, I must say, Jacob Rees-Mogg could tour the halls. Mm. He's the most extraordinary character. And he looks as if he's appearing in a costume all the time. Actually, that's the way he naturally... I mean, he's, he's bright and he's amusing, and I find him very likable. Um, uh, but he does look like a character from a sort of uh, Jeeves and Wooster um, uh, sitcom, doesn't he? Uh, so I don't know what to say. I, I do believe in the value of words. One of the things that saddened me a little bit about the House of Commons is that the chamber of the House of Commons is no longer the fulcrum of debate. You see Prime Minister's questions, and it's a sort of set-piece ding-dong. Mm. The chamber is full then. But I don't know that the exchanges reveal very much. At other times, the chamber is often virtually empty. And I think when I arrived at Westminster, I had hopes that uh, it would be the fulcrum debate, that you would hear fine oratory or good speeches or arguments that could persuade people. And it, sometimes that does occur. There are effective parliamentary speakers on all sides. Uh, people are still in Parliament who were there when I was. For example, Frank Field mm. speaks wonderfully well in Parliament. Ian Duncan Smith, uh, again, these are good parliamentary performers. But it isn't as it was 100 years ago, or even 50 or 60 years ago. The, where it counts now is the television studio, the, the radio studio. That That's where... The debate is going on. And that's frustrating, I think, for backbench members of Parliament, because what they say in the House of Commons goes for so very little. Uh, and that, for me, is a shame. I mean, the work in Parliament now is done in the committees, in the corridors, not so much in the chamber. So, allegedly, Giles, you spoke for 12 and a half hours for charity once. I do. Um, I was just wondering on that, uh, there's a lot of debate actually in politics as to whether, I know they do it in Congress quite a lot, whether oh, you filibuster. should filibuster. Yeah. And um, I know Jacob Rees-Mogg, as we just spoke about him, famously did that and you know, has famously used long words to elongate his speech, such as flocky knocky no hip pillification. I'm not going to try and pronounce that. Uh, but he Didn't is, do badly. <laughs> I've been practicing all day. Do you think this should be allowed? Because obviously you're, you're a massive fan of words, but do, do you think then it does disrupt the, the whole sort of work well, of the Parliament? Well, several things to say. It's flocky knocky no hip That's how you say it. The action of estimating <laughs> as worthless, a word Latin in its origin. And indeed, once in the House of Commons, I did manage to say that a slight inclination of the cranium is as adequate as the spasmodic movement of one optic to an equine quadruped utterly devoid of any visionary capacity, when I could have been more concise and have said, a nod's as good as a wink to a blind horse. Uh, and I think I probably have was guilty of doing some filibustering in my time. Occasionally, it occurs when you... It's to do with sort of parliamentary games that are played. And whether this is a good thing or not, I don't know. I'll give you an example. Why it happens is this. It's been agreed between the whips that uh, there's going to, the, the debate will go on till 10 o'clock. That's when the division will be, and that's when the people will be ready to vote. But sometimes you get shenanigans going on, and so that people can make the business collapse earlier than the agreed time of 10 o'clock. And nobody turns up to speak earlier. And so the business might collapse at 9 o'clock. There's no one there to vote. The vote is called. And the people wanting to bring down the, the bill or the point that they're voting on, they've arranged for their troops to be there. 
and they are ready to vote, and so a piece of business might be lost. In order, therefore, to keep the government business going, the filibuster is required mm. to have someone to keep the thing going until 10 o'clock. That's the reason for a filibuster. And you could say, well, it can be justified because you're trying to secure the business of the government of the day. Um, I don't know that games like that actually enhance government that much. I mean, people who are seriously interested in the fun and games of it, or the way it works, the reality of politics. Uh, when I was an MP, I kept a diary, and it's called Breaking the Code. It's just been reissued, Westminster Diaries, mm. uh, published by Pipeback. And it covers really the years from me becoming a candidate, getting selected, going through a general election, arriving at Westminster, where you really do feel like a new boy at school, you feel totally lost. I mean, I was terribly unhappy the first few days. Really? I mean, really deeply unhappy. It's what I'd wanted all my life. I was in my 40s, and yet I felt like a child. It was, it was a miserable, miserable time. Nervous. Uh, and I was nervous. I felt lost. I thought, why have I done this? I felt it was all pointless. Uh, I, I was angry with myself. I wonder what I let myself in for. But gradually, I began to understand the way it worked. And, and in fact, I had, in many ways, the most rewarding professional time of my life. I ended up in the government whips office, mm. which is a very interesting place to be. Ended up as a Lord Commissioner of the Treasury, as the Treasury whip. It was completely fascinating. Anyway, there is this account of it called Breaking the Code. And people are kind enough to say it's, that it is a good and accurate account of the reality of politics. And it's now, it's extended, it goes really, it covers political life from 1990, it goes from really from the fall of Margaret Thatcher to the arrival of David Cameron, mm -hmm. includes the, the premierships of John Major and Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. And it, it's, it's quite, well, people say it does tell you about the muck and bullets, the harsh reality of what it's like being a backbench MP. And also it takes you into the secret world of the government whip. So anyone who's listening to this, who is studying modern politics, uh, I hope Breaking the Code by me, Giles Brandreth, Westminster Diaries, is on your reading list because I think you'll find it quite intriguing. Mm. You don't need to buy it. You can borrow it from the library. <laughs> and in fact, you should borrow books from the library because if we don't use the libraries, we will lose the libraries. Well, you have a fantastic five-story library, actually, at once. Hey! So, you know, keeping the trend going. Good. You mentioned then about backbenchers. And that's been the subject of uh, the EU debate at the minute, which I can't tell whether people are sick of or quite enjoying because it seems to have gone on for a long time. What's your opinion on, firstly, have you made up your mind on how you'll vote? And secondly, on the campaign in general? You've obviously in the news recently for your hilarious dialogue on Have I Got News For You? Well, where you summed I, up the campaign. I've certainly got my coin ready to <laughs> toss on the uh, 23rd of June if I can't make up my mind before then. When there was the last referendum, however many years ago it was now, 30 or more mm. years ago, I was a young political activist in those days, and um, I was an admirer of uh, Edward Heath, who was the conservative leader at the time, and I was a very keen European, and led something called the People for Europe campaign to get celebrities to support joining the European Union or staying in the European Union. Uh, now, I have to say, I think it's much more closely balanced. And uh, I would find it, as many people do, quite difficult to make up your mind. I don't like the idea of all the bureaucracy that exists, the great machinery that is the European Union. Uh, I don't like the lack of accountability, the remoteness of it. But at the same time, I do like the idea of being outward looking and being part of something that's bigger than ourselves and the idea of the single market. So I'm I'm one of those people who is genuinely torn. Mm. Um, I probably will vote Remain simply because of fearing something worse. But whenever I see them, the, the, the Brexit people, uh, I always find them rather convincing and amusing. I, mean, yeah. I, I, like, I like people like Boris Johnson and Michael Gove. And I find them uh, engaging to, to listen to. And John Redwood, they're, they're articulate and good people. But I can't say that I've made up my mind. And just the last couple of questions before uh, the quick fire round. Oh, it's a, quick fire. it's a quick fire round. It's a quick fire round. <laughs> um, what was your proudest moment in politics, would you say? You were appointed a whip yes. and you had the Marriage Act, which allowed people to marry, not just in churches, wasn't it? It was sort of broadening the places where you could marry. It, 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 now it's taken for granted. People can't remember what it used to be like. Before I introduced the 1994 Marriage Act, 
if you wanted a civil wedding, you had to go to a register office. And register offices were all in sort of county buildings, municipal buildings. And it was like getting married in a public lavatory often. Um, I mean, it was, they were just very dull municipal rooms, um, often really unattractive. And a constituent of mine came to see me. She owned a small castle, Peckforton Castle. And she said, well, if people can get married at Chester Cathedral, why can't they get married, which was my constituency at Chester, why can't they get married at Chester Castle, my castle, or, you know, stately home, a beautiful hotel, historic house. And I agreed with her. And I introduced this legislation, which has changed the nature of marriage. There'll be people listening to this who are thinking of getting married or who have got married and didn't want a church wedding, weren't religious, but wanted a special venue. And it's thanks to my piece of legislation that they're able to get married in that way. So that's my one real claim <laughs> to fame. But curiously, it's a major claim to fame because if you look at the last you know, 15 years, apart from that and um, the legalizing of uh, civil, civil partnerships mm. and then gay marriage, there have not really been fundamental changes that a thousand years or a hundred years from now people will look back on. My other claim to fame is if you go to London and go to Trafalgar Square, you will see there is a plinth on which interesting modern works of art are positioned. This comes about because when I was a parliamentary private secretary to the uh, Secretary of State for the National Heritage, uh, I was walking, the offices were in Trafalgar Square, and I was walking to the office one day from Westminster, and I saw this empty plinth. And I thought, there's an empty plinth, we should put something on it. So I went in and I said, there's an empty plinth out there. Who's responsible? They said, well, I suppose we are. It's the Department of Culture. I said, good. Well, let's put something interesting on it. I said, I'm going to suggest we put Winnie the Pooh, <laughs> Piglet, Gang, <laughs> Eeyore, the whole lot. I said, they're British. They're marvelous. They've given more happiness than all the other. You know, everybody else in the square. I said, you know, Nelson, I know he was a hero, etc. But a lot of people killed in the Battle of Trafalgar. Uh, uh, Winnie the Pooh's only ever done good in our life. And they said, you can't do that. The, the, the place is Trafalgar Square. It's dedicated to military victories. Heroes of the Navy, the Army, the Sea. I said, oh, fine. Fine. Can't have Winnie the Pooh. We will therefore have Margaret Thatcher <laughs> in her tank um, going a, a, across the Falklands with her scarf <laughs> waving behind her, standing up in her tank, um, swinging her handbag. They looked completely shocked at that suggestion. <laughs> So it was then decided, they agreed, though, that there should be something on the plinth, and a committee was set up, and as a result of it, we have these interesting mm. bits of art that go on the plinth. So those are my two contributions to uh, life as a result of being an MP. Uh, the 1994 Marriage Act and something on the plinth in Trafalgar Square. I have to say, once on radio, I was doing an interview like this, and the um, interviewer described me as the expert on the Marriage Act. <laughs> um, my wife was listening and she almost fell off a bunk. And just a final question before our quick fire round. What would you say to, obviously we're a university radio station, what would you say to aspiring politicians and comedians? Well, to aspiring politicians, I would say, go for it. Um, I wanted to be a politician when I was very young. I was president of the union at um, mm. Oxford where I was at university. And, and editor of the magazine. And yeah. editor of the magazine, ISIS, and I directed the arts and all that. But I wanted to be a politician. And I met a lot of politicians at that time. And one of them, who became Chancellor of the Exchequer, a marvellous man called Ian McLeod, he died young. I said, I want to be a politician. And he said to me, go away. I was not following that. Nice. I was French to do He said, go away and do something. Build something. Make something. Have a life. Find yourself a wife. Have some children. Live a bit. And then come back and see me 20 years from now. And that actually was good advice. I think one of the problems with politics now is that people feel they've got to go in in their 20s and they become political advisors uh, and they work their way up the greasy pole that way. I think it stands you in good stead if you've had experience of the real world and then come back into politics having known reality. Otherwise you will spend the whole of your political career being told, what have you ever done in your life? And it's worth doing something in your life before you go into politics. But then when you do, you will discover don't believe what you read in the newspapers. Most of the people I've known in politics are good people committed to bettering the world in which they live, with, or whatever party they belong to, with ideals, good principles, and commitment. 
it is a worthwhile life. Um, being a comedian will don't make me laugh. I don't know what that is about at all. Um, I mean, I just, I, I'm, I, I do shows now and again. I wouldn't really call myself a, a comedian. <laughs> that is a funny idea. But people do seem to laugh during the show, I agree. Um, but that's a tough life. It's a mm, tough yeah. life. And when I began doing it years and years ago, um, all the clubs, uh, all the clubs I would go and perform in, everyone smoked. So you have a lifetime in smoke, smoke-filled rooms. Mm. It was a very str- when not I began, the same smoke-filled rooms as politics, mind you. No, <laughs> no, no. Just cheap cigarettes as opposed to expensive cigars. So I've got no no advice at all. I've got actually, I know nothing. So don't take any advice from me. Um, in fact, if my my advice to you is become a banker, and if you can't become a banker, become a lawyer, and if you can't become a lawyer, become a vet, because vets seem to like their patients. And the patients don't answer back. <laughs> so be a vet. Boodles of money if you're a vet. That's very sought after. And also there are more female vets than male vets now. It's a good equal opportunities career. So that's my advice. Forget comedy. But certainly forget comedy. Forget politics for the moment. Be a vet. Or a banker. Or a lawyer. Or an engineer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The world is actually run fundamentally by the engineers. Or an accountant. If you're an accountant, you can do anything. You really can do anything. It's just a basic qualification. It then frees you up to do anything in the world. I have a daughter who's an accountant. Um, and she's now well, actually she's an economist. But she was an accountant for a while, an economist. She then joined the civil service. You can do anything you like. Anything you like. Oh, brilliant. What are you going to do? Oh, I'd like to go into radio, ideally. That would oh. be the ideal thing. Oh, dear. <laughs> well, you're making a very good start. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. So, quick fire round. Who do you see as the next Conservative Party leader, potentially? Well, it would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? I'm, I'm telling people I'm not running. <laughs> Honestly, if, if they press me, if the call is that great, um, I might consider it. But I don't know is the answer to that. It, I think it does very much depend on the result of the um, referendum vote. Mm. How it goes. Very interesting. I have no idea. Maybe we'll all be surprised. But if required, obviously, I have to argue with my wife. Um, because she doesn't want me to do it anymore, but I'm, I, I'd be ready to serve again. Who do you see as the next president of the US? Well, I must say, I'm fascinated by Donald Trump. <laughs> the most amazing specimen. I'm so excited by his very existence. The idea, you know, that Donald Duck and Woody Woodpecker had a love child at all is amazing to me. <laughs> so I don't know what the result is going to be there either. I met Mrs. Clinton. Oh. She's quite impressive. And I met her husband, the most charming man I've ever met. Mm. No. So I, I don't know. I'm, got, I'm going to be tossing this coin a lot, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, fascinating. Uh, if you had to choose between Monopoly or teddy bears, which one would it be? Teddy bears. Teddy bears. Yeah, yes, I'm a former European Monopoly champion, but Monopoly inevitably ends in tears. <laughs> People fight over Monopoly. Every game of Monopoly ends in tears. And was your father, am I right in saying, the first person to buy one from Selfridges? In 1937, Christmas 1937, he bought a game of Monopoly. And through that, he met my mother... And a few years later, I was born. So, yes, I owe my life to Monopoly. Even so, I prefer teddy bears. And all my teddy bears, there are a thousand of them, now live at something called Newby Hall in North Yorkshire, including the original Fozzie Bear. Oh, yes. so if you like the Muppets, that's the place to go. Newby Hall, North Yorkshire. Say hello. <laughs> Who is your political idol? Goodness, my political idol. Who do I admire in politics? <laughs> I think I admire Arthur Balfour. The reason being, he's the man who said... Nothing matters very much. Most things don't matter at all. Who was your best friend in Parliament? Um, I had lots of very good friends in Parliament on all sides. Uh, a very good friend of mine who'd been at university with me um, was a man called Stephen Milligan. Who sat in the, oh, 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 the house is now open. Do not cross the stage. <laughs> no, this is telling us the show is about to begin. So I had a lot of friends in politics. Um, I got on very well with Tony Benn because we both oh, kept right. diaries. Mm. So... People who keep diaries tend to stick together. And just finally, uh, could you tell us what happened on your train journey uh, involving a public lavatory? Oh, my goodness. I can't tell you about that, but I, I, it's because I'm on Twitter uh, that you know about this. I was yes. so frustrated. I, I should have taken a photograph of it. Um, uh, I, I Basically, what happened is I was in the loo and... Uh, no, I wasn't in the loo. I was trying to go to the loo. I pressed the button and the door opened and this poor man was in the loo 
with his trousers around his knees. And he then tried to press the button to get out, but I pressed the button to close it. So he was pressing the button. He was actually opening it. Anyway, he got caught. And it was, I mean, I'm surprised that neither of us was arrested. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining me. And can I say, Henry Riley, your future in broadcasting is assured. I still think you should become a vet, an accountant, <laughs> a lawyer, or a banker. But if you want to go into radio, do. My name's Giles Brandreth, and you're listening to Raw. Sorry, as my screen pops off for a minute there. That's okay. <laughs> um, it's better than the audience popping off. I have actually, I've had people die in the audience. You're listening to Raw. Oh, the Conservative Party has recovered from everything eventually, yes. And it will recover from this too. Uh, my name is Jacob Rees-Mogg, and you're listening to Raw.